Some people seem like they are obsessed with an incredible darkness. Serial killers in particular are intriguing and hideous at the same time. Although some well-known criminals of this type were active many years ago, such atrocities continue to occur in our time. Tonight we introduce you to one of the most heinous killers in recent crime history. Robert William Willie Picton, born October 24, 1949 is a Canadian serial killer who was convicted in 2007 of the second-degree murders of six women. Arrested in 2002, he was the subject of a lengthy investigation that yielded evidence of numerous other murders. Picton was charged with the deaths of an additional 20 women, many of them from Vancouver's downtown east side, but these charges were stayed by the Crown in 2010. Picton was sentenced to life in prison, with no possibility of parole for 25 years the longest sentence for murder under Canadian law at the time he was sentenced. During the trial's first day of jury evidence, the Crown stated that Picton had confessed to 49 murders to an undercover agent from the Office of Inspector General, who was posing as a cellmate. The Crown reported that Picton told the officer that he wanted to kill another woman to make it an even 50, and that he was caught because he was sloppy. Robert William Picton and his brother David owned a farm in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, 17 miles east of Vancouver. Worker Bill Hiscox called the farm a creepy-looking place and described Picton as a pretty quiet guy whose occasional bizarre behavior, despite no evidence of substance abuse, would draw attention. The Picton brothers began to neglect the site's farming operations. They registered a non-profit charity, the Piggy Palace Good Times Society with the Canadian government in 1996, claiming to organize, coordinate, manage and operate special events, functions, dances, shows and exhibitions on behalf of service organizations, sports organizations and other worthy groups. Its events included raves and wild parties featuring Vancouver sex workers and gatherings in a converted slaughterhouse on the farm at 953 Dominion Avenue in Port Coquitlam. These events attracted as many as 2,000 people, Members of the Hells Angels were known to frequent the farm. On March 23, 1997, Picton was charged with the attempted murder of sex worker Wendy Lynn Eistetter, whom he had stabbed several times during an altercation at the farm. Eistetter had informed police that Picton had handcuffed her, but that she had escaped after suffering several lacerations. She told them she had disarmed him and stabbed him with his weapon. Picton sought treatment at Eagle Ridge Hospital while Eistetter recovered at the nearest emergency room. He was released on 2000 Canadian dollar bond. The charge was dismissed in January 1998. Months later, the Pictons were sued by Port Coquitlam officials for violating zoning ordinances, neglecting the agriculture for which it had been zoned, and having altered a large farm building on the land for the purpose of holding dances, concerts and other recreations. The Pictons ignored the legal pressure and held a 1998 New Year's party, after which they were faced with an injunction banning future parties. The police were authorized to arrest and remove any person attending future events at the farm. The society's non-profit status was removed the following year, for inability to procure financial statements. It was subsequently disbanded. Over the course of three years, Hiscox noticed that women who visited the farm eventually went missing. On February 6, 2002, police executed a search warrant for illegal firearms at the property. Robert and David Picton were arrested and police obtained a second warrant using what they had seen on the property to search the farm as part of the BC Missing Women investigation. Personal items belonging to missing women were found at the farm, which was sealed off by members of the Joint RCMP Vancouver Police Department Task Force. The following day, Picton was charged with weapons offenses. Both of the Pictons were later released, however Robert Picton was kept under police surveillance. On February 22, Robert Picton was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Serena Abadzwe and Mona Wilson. On April 2, three more charges were added for the murders of Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock, and Heather Bottomley. A sixth charge for the murder of Andrea Josbury was laid on April 9, followed shortly by a seventh for Brenda Wolfe. On September 20, four more charges were added for the slayings of Georgina Papon, Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmark, and Jennifer Furminger. Four more charges for the murders of Heather Chinnick, Tanya Hollick, Sherry Irving, and Inga Hall were laid on October 3. 
bringing the total to 15. This was the largest investigation of any serial killer in Canadian history. On May 26, 2005, 12 more charges were laid against Picton for the killings of Kara Ellis, Andrea Burhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marnie Frey, Tiffany Drew, Carrie Koski, Sarah DeVries, Cynthia Felix, Angela Jardine, Wendy Crawford, Diana Melnick, and Jane Doe, bringing the total number of first-degree murder charges to 27. Excavations continued at the farm through November 2003, the cost of the investigation is estimated to have been $70 million by the end of 2003, according to the provincial government. As of 2015 the property is fenced off, underlain by the Crown and Right of British Columbia. In the meantime, all the buildings on the property, except a small barn, had been demolished. Forensic analysis proved difficult because the bodies may have been left to decompose, or be eaten by insects and pigs on the farm. During the early days of the excavations, forensic anthropologists brought in heavy equipment, including two 50-foot flat conveyor belts and soil sifters to find traces of human remains. On March 10, 2004, the government revealed that Picton may have ground up human flesh and mixed it with pork that he sold to the public, the province's health authority later issued a warning. Another claim was made that he fed the bodies directly to his pigs. A preliminary inquiry was held in 2003, the testimony from which was covered by a publication ban until 2010. At the inquiry, the fact was revealed that Picton had been charged with attempted murder in connection with the stabbing of sex worker Wendy Lynn Eistetter in 1997. Eistetter testified at the inquiry that after Picton had driven her to the Port Coquitlam farm and had sex with her, he slapped a handcuff on her left hand and stabbed her in the abdomen. She stabbed Picton in self-defense. Later, both she and Picton were treated at the same hospital, where staff used a key they found in Picton's pocket to remove the handcuffs from the woman's wrist. The attempted murder charge against Picton was stayed on January 27, 1998, because the woman had drug addiction issues and prosecutors believed her too unstable for her testimony to help secure a conviction. The clothes and rubber boots Picton had been wearing that evening were seized by police and left in an RCMP storage locker for more than seven years. Not until 2004 did lab testing show that the DNA of two missing women was on the item seized from Picton in 1997. In 1998, according to Vancouver Police Detective Constable Lorimer Schenner, Schenner learned of a call made to a police tip phone line stating that Picton should be investigated in the case of the women's disappearances. According to Schenner's account, described at length in his 2015 book about the case, he struggled to attract sufficient police resources and attention to the case until the 2002 search of Picton's farm by the RCMP. In 1999, Canadian police had received a tip that Picton had a freezer filled with human flesh on his farm. Although they interviewed Picton, who denied killing the missing women, and obtained his consent to search his farm. The police never conducted one. Picton's trial began on January 30, 2006 in New Westminster. Picton pleaded not guilty to 27 charges of first-degree murder in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. The voir dire phase of the trial took most of the year to determine what evidence might be admitted before the jury. Reporters were not allowed to disclose any of the material presented in the arguments. On March 2, one of the 27 counts was rejected by Justice James Williams for lack of evidence. On August 9, Justice Williams severed the charges, splitting them into one group of six counts and another group of 20 counts. The trial proceeded on the group of six counts. The remaining 20 counts could have been heard in a separate trial, but ultimately were stayed on August 4, 2010. Because of the publication ban, full details of the decision are not publicly available, but the judge has explained that trying all 26 charges at once would put an unreasonable burden on the jury, as the trial could last up to two years. It also would have had an increased chance for a mistrial. The judge added that the six counts he chose had materially different evidence from the other 20. Office of Inspector General Senior Investigator R.J. McDougall was case agent for the investigation. The date for the jury trial of the first six counts was initially set to start January 8, 2007 but was later postponed to January 22. On that date, Picton faced first-degree murder charges in the deaths of Frey, Abatsway, Papan, Josbury, Wolf, and Wilson. 
The media ban was lifted, and for the first time Canadians heard the details of what was found during the long investigation, skulls cut in half with hands and feet stuffed inside. The remains of one victim found stuffed in a garbage bag, and her blood-stained clothing found in Picton's trailer, part of another victim's jawbone and teeth found beside Picton's slaughterhouse. And a 22 caliber revolver with an attached dildo containing both his and the victim's DNA. In a videotaped recording played for the jury, Picton claimed to have attached the dildo to his weapon as a makeshift silencer. As of February 20, 2007, the following information has been presented to the court. During Picton's trial, lab staff testified that about 80 unidentified DNA profiles, roughly half male and half female, had been detected on evidence. The items police found inside Picton's trailer. A loaded 22 revolver with a dildo over the barrel and one round fired, boxes of 357 Magnum handgun ammunition, night vision goggles, two pairs of faux fur line handcuffs, a syringe with 3 milliliters of blue liquid inside, and Spanish fly aphrodisiac. A videotape of Picton's friend Scott Chubb saying Picton had told him a good way to kill a female heroin addict was to inject her with windshield washer fluid. A second tape was played for Picton, in which an associate named Andrew Bellwood said Picton mentioned killing sex workers by handcuffing and strangling them, then bleeding and gutting them before feeding them to pigs. Photos of the contents of a garbage can found in Picton's slaughterhouse, which held some remains of Mona Wilson. In October 2007, a juror was accused of having made up her mind already that Picton was innocent. The trial judge questioned the juror, saying, It's reported to me you said from what you had seen you were certain Mr. Picton was innocent, there was no way he could have done this. That the court system had arrested the wrong guy. The juror denied this completely. Justice Williams ruled that she could remain on the jury since it had not been proven she made the statements. Justice James Williams suspended jury deliberations on December 6, 2007, after he discovered an error in his charge to the jury. Earlier in the day, the jury had submitted a written question to Justice James requesting clarification of his charge, asking are we able to say yes, i.e., find picked and guilty, if we infer the accused acted indirectly? On December 9, 2007, the jury returned a verdict that Picton is not guilty on six counts of first-degree murder, but is guilty on six counts of second-degree murder. A second-degree murder conviction carries a punishment of a life sentence, with no possibility of parole for a period between 10 and 25 years, to be set by the trial judge. On December 11, 2007, after reading 18 victim impact statements, British Columbia Supreme Court Judge Justice James Williams sentenced Picton to life with no possibility of parole for 25 years, the maximum punishment for second-degree murder, and equal to the sentence which would have been imposed for a first-degree murder conviction. Mr. Picton's conduct was murderous and repeatedly so. I cannot know the details but I know this, what happened to them was senseless and despicable, said Justice Williams in passing the sentence. Picton had faced a further 21st-degree murder charges involving other female victims from Vancouver's downtown east side. On February 26, 2008, a family member of one of the 20 women named as alleged victims told the media that the Crown had told her a trial on the further 20 counts might not proceed. BC Crown spokesman Neil McKenzie announced that the prosecution of Picton on the 20 other murder charges would likely be discontinued. In reaching this position, he said, the branch has taken into account the fact that any additional convictions could not result in any increase to the sentence that Mr. Picton has already received. Families of the victims had varied reactions to this announcement. Some were disappointed that Picton would never be convicted of the 20 other murders, while others were relieved that the gruesome details of the murders would not be aired in court. In August 2006, Thomas Laudamy, a 27-year-old Fremont, California resident, claimed that he had received three letters from Robert Picton in response to letters Laudamy sent under an assumed identity. In the letters, Picton allegedly speaks with concern about the expense of the investigation, asserts his innocence, quotes and refers to the Bible, praises the trial judge, and responds in detail to information in Laudamy's letters, which were written in the guise of Maya Barnett, a down-on-her-luck woman. In 2016, 
a book claimed to have been written by Picton entitled Picton, in his own words, went up for sale and initiated controversy, critical petitions and actions by government to prevent Picton from profiting from the work. Picton was described as getting his manuscript out of prison by passing it to a former cellmate who then sent it to a retired construction worker from California named Michael Childres. Even if it is still not entirely clear what happened to some of the victims, Picton embodies a hideous abyss of the human psyche. What goes on in a person who does such deeds? How should a society react to this? Even if we will probably never find an unequivocal answer, we make it our task to introduce you to more murder cases in the future. If you enjoyed what you saw today please consider to like the video. If you help us in this way, we can continue to work on interesting mysteries and tragedies. Have a nice and calm night shift. See you next time.